All right, John chapter 3. You know, I've been working on uh, parables of the kingdom. And I had said today was going to be my last message kind of about the kingdom. And I planned on preaching initially uh, kingdom priorities. But I'm actually going to bump that for a week. Just got a few other things I want to, want to bring into that. And so that'll be next week. I just figured I'm going to take a step back today and hit one other aspect of the kingdom that's, that's brought out here. Very basic, but I think essential, important uh, for us to, to understand and as we share with other people, I think it's important to recognize. So we're going to start in John 3, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12, but we're just going to key in on verses 3 through 5 this morning. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that which we know, and bear witness of that which we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just praise you for everything you do for us, what you've done, what you continue to do. We're appreciative for your body. We're thankful for the kingdom. And Lord, that you have opened up our eyes, that we can see the church in her glory, in her beauty. As you really radiate your light through us. We're appreciative for your teachings on the kingdom. and Just to give us the perspective from the throne. From heaven itself. Where we can see things as they really are. And Lord, I ask that you, you help us all to have that right perspective. And Father, as we work with other people. That we would be able to come back to this basic teaching from, from Jesus, to recognize people can't see, they can't see until they're born again, and so that we would start on the things that are important and help people to be able to be born again so that their eyes can be open. Lord, may all of us continue to keep our eyes wide open for you, to see the things that are really important, to keep those as priorities in our lives. May you be glorified, Lord, through this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, lots of confusion about the kingdom. You know, in this world we live in, you guys know, it, there's confusion everywhere. In darkness, dark place. And, uh, you know, I think Isaiah 59 says, talking about that this culture that we grope along the wall like blind men. And there's darkness everywhere. And sometimes, I'll be honest, sometimes I get a little bit frustrated about that darkness. And think, how, how do you crack into that? How do you pierce through that? And sometimes you talk to people and it's just like, I can't even figure out what planet they're on in, in a spiritual realm. How do you even start conversations? They're just so confused and, and in such darkness. But... You know, and sometimes there's a tendency maybe to get angry. And I think there is righteous anger. There are those who are proponents of spreading the darkness, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But the reality is the average Joe out there, he confused. He brainwashed. He been lied to. He's in that, he's in a phase, in, in a fog. And yeah, he made choices in reference to his sin. But there, there are people, you know, like Jason was talking, but there are people everywhere. They need hope. And there's none outside of Jesus. So there's a lot of confusion about the kingdom. And to 
sometimes, you know, premillennialism, and you have these conversations come up. And I remember a guy from Billings, he's a Christian now, was here yesterday, his, his son was, was in the Bible Bowl. But when he first uh, was becoming a Christian, you know, along the way, this, this process, he's super confused about the kingdom. And it was a barrier for him, his, his misunderstanding about that. And we just talked about, okay, we got to come back and start where Jesus starts. And what Jesus says in verse 3, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Jesus, this conversation that he has with Nicodemus, I'm always, I always like how Steve Doty talks about this is the first episode of Nick at Night. You know, and, and, and it was. This is his first time. Nicodemus, a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. A indicator. He's a, a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel and don't understand these things? Nicodemus is a buddy with Joseph of Arimathea. You know, the, the scripture definitively says that he was a member of the council who had not consented to their plan and action of having Jesus be crucified. And Joseph is spoken of, actually, as somebody who was, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is a buddy. These guys team up to make sure that Jesus uh, is buried in, in, a, in a thoughtful way. I think the bottom line about Nicodemus, guys, he's a truth seeker. He says here, we know you've come from God. Nicodemus is paying attention. He says, nobody can do the signs that you do unless God's with him. Guys, there are people out there who are truth seekers. They're looking. They're watching. And you know what? Most of them initially are going to come to you by night. Because in the culture we live in, you don't dare talk about truth openly. They're going to catch you on the corner outside after work. They're not going to engage in the, in the lunch room where everybody else around. Rarely are you going to find people where you can actually talk about the real thing. But truth seekers are paying attention. Maybe come around a little off to the side. Nicodemus, a truth seeker, stuck up for Jesus. The, the Feast of Booths came up a little bit this morning in, in Sunday school class. The Feast of Booths, John chapter 7. These guys send guys to go arrest Jesus and bring him back. And the officers come back without him. And they're like... Where is he? It's like, nobody ever spoke the way this guy spoke. I love that line, too. I'm like, are you guys, you know, the, the law, we expect these guys, they are the people, the, the multitudes, we expect them to be confused. They don't know the law. You know, you, you got, they don't know the law, they're accursed, thinking Jesus might be somebody. And Nicodemus is like, hey, we don't judge somebody. According to our own law, we don't judge somebody unless we hear him first, Right? He's a truth seeker. Like, wait a second, what's going on? Like, what, you're a Galilee too? Go search the scriptures. See, no prophet arises out of Galilee. They missed Isaiah chapter 9, by the way. Okay? But, but Nicodemus is a truth seeker. And guys, those are, people, those are people that we're looking for. And so in his conversation, Jesus gets right to the point. He says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now, Dick, Nicodemus was interested in the kingdom. But he couldn't see it. I've never been blind in a physical sense. But sometimes my persp I think this helps me with my perspective. When I come across people with physical disabilities, I don't usually get mad at them. I'm, I'm merciful to them, right? You, hey, how can, I, how can I help you? I've never been blind in a physical sense, but I, I do need these. To see. I, uh, wow, it's gotten a lot worse over the years, too. Okay? I can, if I didn't know Mel and Judy were sitting in the front, I'm not sure I would, I, the faces are very blurry. Okay? But, you know, in college, I was big mechanical engineering, thermodynamics class, big room. I was sitting, I uh, never got to that one early enough to get in the front three rows. So sitting with my buddy about the middle of class, this classroom, and they're writing stuff on the board, and I was like, how do you see that? And he goes, and I was like, oh, okay. I probably need to go get mine checked out. You know, I'm definitely, uh, definitely nearsighted. And uh, I've been teaching Lily 
a little bit in math class, but enjoying doing that. But for some reason, Lily's glasses seem to be broken as much as there <laughs> she has them this year. And uh, I was asking, I was like, are you nearsighted or farsighted? They're like, just blind. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of believe that. I'm pretty much blind. You know, it's tough to see. And I noticed for her even, math was more difficult without her glasses. When you don't have study, you can't see. And so the kingdom of God, brother, we know is a spiritual kingdom. Jesus actually says, you know, he gets asked a question by the Pharisees about when the kingdom of God's coming. He says, he says the kingdom of God isn't coming with signs to be observed. It's actually, it's in your midst. They missed it. They, they couldn't see. They weren't looking for the right things. You know, the kingdom that's prophesied back there in, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You have all these physical kingdoms. You know, the, the head of gold, Babylon, and you guys know the rest of it, etc. You go down, and then there's this stone that's cut out without hands that comes in and smashes this statue at the feet. And this stone grows into the mountain that fills the whole earth. This stone that's cut out without hands, it's a divine kingdom. It's not like the rest of them. Jesus, before Pontius Pilate, he actually says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not of this realm. It's a spiritual kingdom. And you can have 20-20 vision in the physical realm and be totally blind in the spiritual realm. So, just a question I thought about. Jesus says, unless one's born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. What is it that blinds you in the spiritual realm? What, what causes that? Well, the, the short scriptural answer is the flesh. The flesh blinds you to the things of the spirit. We know the flesh is at enmity with the spirit. It's what, the flesh is what keeps people from seeing into the spiritual realm. I, again, I just find it interesting as Jesus comes and the Jews are interested. They're waiting for a Messiah. They're looking for a Christ with great expectation. They even, in John chapter 6, they want to come by force and, and make him to be king. But what they were looking for was a physical kingdom. They had fleshly interests. They were fleshly motivated. And because of that, they missed seeing him for who he is. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 for a second. Second Corinthians chapter 3, specifically talking about the Jews here. I think the application is, is across the board. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The scripture says here the problem is the mind. You can read on chapter 4. Satan's blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Another way he says it here is a heart, the heart. He says this veil lies over the heart. Anybody remember a, a phrase that shows up a few times in the, in the Old Testament in reference to the Jews? Stephen, when he's on kind of trial right before they stone him, he actually called, he says, you men, uncircumcised of heart and ears, stiff-necked, right? You guys, are, you guys are resisting the Holy Spirit, just as your fathers did. But uncircumcised of heart. The heart's the problem. There's, there's a barrier. There's a veil. There's something that's lying over the heart that keeps the heart from being able to see the things that are important. And that veil is the flesh. 1 Corinthians. Hopefully we all got a little something out of 1 Corinthians over the, this last year. And, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it talks about, you know, the, basically the, the natural man. He can't understand the things of the Spirit. He can't appraise them. Now, guys, that doesn't mean that somebody that's outside of Christ can't pick up this book and understand the basic things. God wrote this in a manner that anybody who's willing to be honest can sort their way through this. But what it means is that if you're not spiritual, if you don't have the Spirit of God, 
you aren't going to be able to place appropriate value and see things for what they really are. I think about, my girls actually had, had a question for me, like, you know, what, what, is that, what does that appraise mean? It's like, okay. I don't, I can, I can walk into somebody's house and you can say, how much is this house worth? And especially going from Billings to Bozeman, I'll do what I think it would be and multiply it by at least one and a half, maybe two, and I might be in ballpark. But I don't have a real good perspective. I'm a, I could be off around here by a couple hundred thousand dollars easily on my initial uneducated appraisal. Now, I bet Nick Jacobs walks into a place and probably has a little better idea than I would. You could probably be pretty ballpark just because of making bids and that kind of stuff. You know, and then you get someone that's an appraiser. They do that stuff all the time. They're going to be real, real close. Okay? They can see it. For what it is. I don't even know what I'm looking for. I'm just, okay, some property, a house on it in Bozeman, Montana. It's approximately that size. Here's my ballpark figure, and I can be quite a bit off. People who are outside of Christ, they cannot see it for what it is. And so the, the problem is, actually, it's even a lot deeper than that. This flesh, it's a blinder. It's a cover. It's a veil over the heart, and it cannot see the value. You're just blinded to it. And so, bottom line is, flesh got to be done away with. And that's what Jesus is going to go on to work on here. He says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. Literally in this passage, born from above. I'm not going to spend too much time on that today. But Nicodemus, he literally had no clue what he was talking about. You guys ever hear in the religious world, somebody says, you a born again Christian? I'm a born-again Christian. Like, there's no such thing as a Christian who's not born again, okay? So it's a little bit of that, some of that Pentecostal, you know, lingo that, that people have. But you, you talk to a non-Christian about being born again, and the further we get, this country gets away from even a, a God basis, what, are you, what in the world are you talking about? Okay. So Nicodemus doesn't know. He has no clue. He's thinking in the realm of the physical. I mean, can you go back into your, into your mother's womb, be born, start this birth process all over again? Jesus defines this. In John 3, verse 5, he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We know Peter talks about born again also. Peter says we've been born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we've been born again through this living and abiding word, Okay? Not preaching on that this morning. I'm going to key in on what Jesus is talking about. He says, unless one is born of water in the spirit. If I had this board up here, I'd write, born again equals being born of water in the spirit. This is the explanation. Born again? Nicodemus says, what is that talking about? Jesus comes back, born of water in the spirit. This is how this happens. Okay. So born again equals being born of water in the spirit. He explains this a little bit. And when Jesus is telling Nicodemus this, Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead yet. He's looking, it's actually for the future. Okay, throughout the Gospel of John, you see a lot of this. Okay, teachings that aren't going to be understood until looking back. On it. He's prepping Nicodemus for the new covenant and anybody else who's listening. Okay. So we can understand now what, what Jesus is talking about the problem is sin, the barrier is flesh, and the solution is to be born of water in the spirit. Most of you guys know this. Well, where else in the scriptures do we see a connection between water and the spirit? Hopefully we all have some verses popping into our mind. I heard somebody, I think, whisper, Acts 2.38. Let's go there. This, this is important. Mr. Wilson actually hit it a little bit in his Bible school class this morning. you got to funnel this stuff down. People that are total non-believers, you can't even start here. you got to come step back and say, is, how do we know the Bible's true? People that claim to be, believe the Bible, now we got to get to where's our starting point? Where are we coming to? 
Mr. Wilson talked about rabbit shooters, establishing old covenant, new covenant. And then you got to get to the topic of salvation. Jesus goes there quickly with Nicodemus, doesn't he? He just... Nicodemus question, Jesus says, can't even, aren't, can't even see this unless you're born again. You can argue with people about, I'll use Mr. Wilson's terminology from class this morning, you can chase rabbits around the room and around the countryside for a long time. The starting point, you got to bring them back to here. You're not going to understand. You aren't going to be able to deal with those other things. They're not going to be able to understand the value of any of that unless they're born again. So let's start where Jesus started. In Acts chapter 2, I am going to skip to verse 38. The question comes, brethren, what should we do? In verse 37 and verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Immersion is mentioned here. The Spirit is mentioned here. Now, some people got a little bit of hang-up. How do we know that's immersion in water? It's, he says here, immersion in the name of Jesus Christ, right? How do, do we know what immersion in the name of Jesus Christ is? Hopefully you have some verses to go to. Acts 10, 47 and 48 establishes definitively. Immersion in the name of Jesus Christ is in water. I, I'm really trying to hurry here, but... I had a debate a number of years ago, a guy named Lester Hall from a place called New Life Assembly. He's one of those guys, Mr. Wilson, that uh, if you read about him, he had a vision from an angel. And uh, kind of sounds, the story remount, sounded remotely similar to Joseph Smith's, actually, when I was reading it through. It was like, wow, people go for this stuff. Okay, So he was supposed to go start this congregation, this New Life outfit. But anyways, this guy shows up, we're having... It, Long story, he showed up unannounced because he didn't want to go through the real debate process. So he shows up unannounced one Lord's Day night. We have this little impromptu debate. And uh, he starts talking about baptism and blood. And uh, is his argument for that night that it's really not baptism in water, it's baptism in blood. So I come down and, and uh, he actually somewhere mentions Acts 10. And he reads 47. But he didn't read verse 48. That was my turn. I was like, I forgot to read the rest of this. <laughs> Acts 10, 48 definitively makes the point immersion in the name. It's 47, 48. You read those together. Immersion in the name of Jesus Christ is immersion in water. At that point in time, he's like, oh, I, you confused me there. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. You guys got a good pastor and all, but he's just a little confused on some stuff. That was his answer to that. It's definitive. One of the things, as long as it's been in 1 Corinthians, think about this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul's thankful that he didn't immerse many there in Corinth, right? Why? He says, so nobody would say, you are immersed in my name. Now, when Paul is talking about immersing people there in Corinth, he's talking about dunking them in water, isn't he? Like when Jesus gives the command, go make disciples and immerse them, like that's something you can follow through on to actually do. Okay? Paul's preaching the gospel. He didn't come in, in that context to immerse. He came to preach the gospel. Short answer on that. It's the responsibility of the individual that hears the gospel to get immersed. But Paul, is, he, is he's doing the dunking. Like, this is actually in water. And he says, I'm thankful I didn't do that to many of you in Corinth. So you couldn't say it was in my name. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? And that is immersion in water. As a side note, Everybody in Corinth that's a Christian was immersed. You can check that out in Acts chapter 18 and in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Okay? Everybody that was in Corinth that's a Christian was immersed. Okay? Immersion in the name of Jesus Christ is in water. Acts 2.38 is one of those connections. How about Titus 3.5? Let's turn there. If you guys' minds like mine, I, we're all different. I can, I can remember a lot of things, but numbers I really struggle with. I really struggle to remember numbers. So I have to do tricks uh, for numbers. John 3, 5. Titus 3, 5. That, that's just handy. Okay? They're good parallel passages to have kind of locked away in, in your brain. Titus chapter 3, 
verse 5, I'm just going to jump straight to it. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The literal here is the, the bath of regeneration. You got water and spirit here in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. The washing, you're born of water, you get dunked into Christ. Okay? There's a rebirth, there's a regeneration. God puts his spirit in you, you receive the gift of the spirit, and the spirit is the renewing aspect. Thankful for that. How about 1 John chapter 5? I like to bring this one in every once in a while. One of the things Lester Hall had a real problem with is that immersion in water, somehow from his perspective, if you think immersion in water, if you believe what the scripture says, like 1 Peter 3, 21, okay, corresponding to that, immersion now saves you. Again, the context is water. Go, go read verse 20. Okay. You, have, you have a problem with that because somehow that's nullifying the blood of Christ. So I like 1 John 5 here. Verse 8, for there are three that bear witness, the spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in a debate. Oh, spirit and the water and the blood, the three agree, don't they? They're in agreement on this. So immersion is the only place wherein the new birth occurs. Long and the short of it, guys, we got to start here with people. Otherwise, you're going to be arguing about stuff you're never going to come to answers about. And I will say this. If a person can't be honest enough to recognize that for the forgiveness of sins means for the forgiveness of sins, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, don't try to explain to them that the thousand years, what that is from the book of Revelation. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Word of God's living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm going to just fast forward to this. It pierces division of soul and spirit. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Christianity is not an IQ test. I've had people that can't hardly read, can barely read. I've got to help them through the words of Acts 2.38, and they hear for the forgiveness of sins. And they're like, that's what it says. It's not an IQ test. It is an integrity test. I've had some very book-learned, intelligent people read Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and they cannot, actually sometimes they can't read the words for the forgiveness of sins because their belief system won't allow them to read those words. So we have to start where Jesus starts. Okay? Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. Brian, we want people's eyes to be opened. Uh, recognize people, they're, they're blind. They need help. Okay? We want them to be able to see the glories of the kingdom. That lasts forever. I mean, man, you talk about a place without hope. How would you like to have your hope fixed in this life, in this world, in this country right now? It's a train wreck. This thing going down and everything that history would ever teach us, then no coming back from it. People need to see the kingdom because the kingdom endures forever. We have to start where Jesus started. Understand the context, okay? Some people, we got to start back further, okay? But get it to this point. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 3 for a second because, okay, if, if the barrier is the flesh and Jesus says the solution for people to be able to see is to be born again, to be born of water and the Spirit, we would expect that that the flesh, that something would happen to that flesh at immersion into Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, I'm just going to read this again, verse 14. Their minds were hardened, for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed where? In Christ. 
Now, a little bit later, he's going to say, whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I'm not preaching on turning to the Lord today, but you'll see that also is a description in the New Testament of a person being immersed into Christ. Okay? But I'm just going to key in on this. That veil is removed in Christ. How's a person get into Christ? I, I've found that it helps people sometimes to have a, a little visual. So I'm Bible studying with people. Just take our Bible here. This side of the page, lost, saved, going to hell, on the way to heaven, out of Christ, in Christ. How do we get from this to here? You got to get in Christ. The veil's going to be removed, right? How do we get there? You got to get into Christ. Romans 6 3, Galatians 3 27. Two places, the only two places in the New Testament, tell us how to get into Christ. It's through immersion. Okay? That's where the veil is taken away. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, one of my favorites. Colossians 2, and for the sake of time, I'm going to jump in the middle of a sentence here. Sometimes you've got to do that with some of Paul's writings. Uh, I'm going to jump into verse 11. In him, that's in Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in immersion in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You know, a number of years ago, I had a couple little girls in, in school, in Billings, in the Christian school there. And uh, they came to me one day and said, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, please pray for our little brother. I was like, okay, what's, what's going on? He has to have surgery. I was like, okay, I'll pray for him. What's, do you know what the surgery is? Grandma says he has to be circumcised. It's like, Okay. Pretty normal thing, um, you know, it happens pretty often, but I'll pray. I'll pray for him. Okay. Is, there is surgery there, isn't there? There's an operation. Okay. I think King James here says, talks about uh, in which you're raised up with him through faith in the operation of God. Okay. New American Standard says the working of God. Okay. There is a surgery that happens here. It is the removal of the body of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ. It's that barrier is taken out of the way. Now where does he say that happens here? The removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in immersion, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, or the operation of God. The operating table is our immersion into Christ. Now I've, I've found this interesting. A number of us have had to, to have some operations over the years. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever argued with your doctor about what room? Lynn's argued with the doctor. Let me finish, let me finish the question. Let me finish the question here. Okay. Have you ever argued with the doctor about what room the operation is going to be done in? And I remember when my brother Matt had to have that back surgery. He put some thought into where you're going to go and have that done. I don't remember Matt ever calling up his doctor and saying, you need to come to my house, please, and have the surgery for me in my place. That ain't the way it works, is it? If you have faith in the doctor and the operation he's going to perform, you're going to go to where he asked you to go to get her done. Because We know this, but it's still important. There's only one surgeon in the universe, heaven above, earth below, who's able to perform the circumcision of the heart, to remove the body of the flesh. You can try all the 12-step programs you want to in the world. You can read the, the 12 Rules of Life by Jordan Peterson. You can go through all the, the psychological stuff. You can go into treatment. You can go into counseling and You can get that flesh maybe directed slightly better. You're never going to get the removal of the flesh outside of the operation of Jesus Christ. We want people to see. We want to see, right? 
Now, it's possible. It's possible for us as Christians, the spiritual cataracts to kind of start growing. And go back and cloud and, and reblind. Okay? Don't want to do that. Keep your eyes open. I'm going to put in a little plug here. Tonight in James, our study we're going to be going over, looking into the mirror, and we're going to talk about what we're seeing in the mirror. Like, there's some power there. The glorified Christ. But for today's purpose, the main thing I'm saying is we got to start where Jesus started. You can't see the kingdom. Nobody's going to be able to understand it. We're going to never appreciate the value of it unless we're born again. If you're outside of Christ, you are on the outside. You know, I, there's a lady I studied with, and uh, we're talking about how God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. Isaiah 59 is pretty definitive on that. James chapter 2, John chapter 9. We got a lot of places that are pretty definitive on that. So she looked at me and she said, you know, so she said, so, so I'm on the outside looking in. And I said, yep. She was like, who are you to judge me? Well, I said, well, you said it. <laughs> She's like, I know, but I was hoping you weren't going to agree with me. But, you know, she, she followed through on that. But the reality, and she told me at the time, she was coming to assembly and stuff. She's like, I always, but she was like, I feel, I feel like I'm on the outside. She told me that same day. It's like, you are. You are. You can't see this. You can't fully be a part of it. You'll never understand the value of it until you're immersed into Jesus Christ. Until you're born again. Wow, the kingdom's amazing. And this lady's gone on. Older lady, she's gone on to do amazing. She loves the kingdom. The value. It's everything in her life. That's the way God made it, isn't it? That's the way God designed it. So, brethren, I, I want to encourage you. Hey, make sure. Make sure you know where you're at. If you haven't been born again in accordance with what Jesus teaches, you have veil. You're going to be blind. You can argue all day long with God about where you're going to have that surgery. Or you can say, okay, God. You know, naming the leper. His first response is, I'm not going to the Jordan River. Rivers back home are cleaner than that. Whoa, 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 wait a second. It's not a hard thing to do. It's about having faith in the surgeon. He says that's where the operation's done. And get her done there. And those spiritual eyes allow them to be opened. And then keep looking and share with others. Let's get this kingdom of Jesus Christ built.